welcome to another one of our ongoing sessions uh, discussing the Old Testament. I'm Paul Hoskison from the Department of Ancient Scripture, and I'm joined today by three of my colleagues also from the Department of Ancient Scripture. To my left, D. Kelly Ogden. Across the table from me, Eric Huntsman, and to my right, Michael Rhodes. In previous sessions, we discussed the, uh, the rise of King David. Today, uh, we'll be discussing 2 Samuel 6 through 12, which begins the, the zenith of David's uh, uh, kingship and his eventual slow decline. We'd like to begin in uh, chapter 6 of 2 Samuel. And in this incident, David is going to bring up the Ark of the Covenant finally into Jerusalem after Jerusalem has been captured. And we have an interesting episode here beginning in verse 6. And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the Ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the Ark of God. Well, this upset David a little bit, and uh, they, they, they eventually named the place after the poor man who died there. Uh, there's an interesting theological principle here involved. Would anyone like to make a comment on it? There can only be authorized handling of a sacred object, and apparently this person was unauthorized. And uh, we have a term for this. It's called steadying the ark. Right. Right. Uh, today, we often use it to refer to those who would like to... Uh, to uh, tell the brethren, uh, or even our local brethren, uh, how to run the church. And it's, it's a dangerous thing to mm. do. Right. In fact, there's a reference in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 85, a letter of the Prophet Joseph Smith to W.W. W. Phelps. And we have an, a, an oblique reference to Uzzah in 85, verse 8. When that man who is called of God and appointed, when that man who is called of and appointed, that putteth forth his hand to steady the ark of God, shall fall by the shaft of death. So we know that that is a principle, a general principle that's still in play today. Absolutely. Very good. Moving on now into chapter 7, uh, 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 David is allowed, the, uh, thinks he's going to be able to build the temple, and the Lord tells him otherwise. Uh, why, why wasn't David allowed to build the temple? Well, he's told there by the prophet uh, Nathan uh, in uh, verse 12, for example, uh, when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers. I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, and he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So uh, in the Lord's timetable, it was uh, to be Solomon rather than David to do it, and he also uh, mentions elsewhere that it's because he's a man of blood, uh, that he's been involved in a lot of warfare, and. Uh, the, the Lord uh, simply chooses to, to have this temple built by his uh, son rather than uh, David himself. Yet that promise about Solomon succeeding is, is very pivotal for the narrative and, and of course for history because this is the clearest expression of the Davidic covenant. Nathan says, yes, you can't build the temple, but you will have a successor. And he says that they will always be someone from his house. His throne will be established forever in verse 16. Uh, and of course, the house of David had a lot of hope in that. They thought that their line would never be extinguished, but we know the ultimate fulfillment of that, of course, was Christ. That through Jesus Christ, who is a descendant of David, there always would be a righteous Often king on the, the throne. Son of David. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. a descendant of David. So David and his band of men had taken this little Jebusite enclave there. So it became known as the city of David. It didn't belong to any of the other tribes, uh, just like neutral ground. In, in, in our nation. We have a, a District of Columbia that doesn't belong to any of the states governing over all the entire country. So it, it's the city of David, but by bringing the ark into the city and an announcement that a temple would be built there, it becomes a city of God, too. Mm -hmm. Any city that's going to have a temple is going to be a privileged city. Uh, well, the Lord had been saying that all along. The place where I'm going to put my name. There you will And worship. that is uh, Jerusalem, yes. Mm -hmm. I think, Kelly, it would be helpful, too, at this point to describe what that city might have looked like in those days, the size and the position of it. And uh, Some of our viewers may have been to Jerusalem and have viewed the Temple Mount, but, but what we're talking about is something different than that. The, the Temple Mount, uh, the eastern part of today's old city, is where the ancient temple of Solomon and then a second temple was built there on that same spot. But uh, 
That came just a little later. David, the city that David took was just uh, 12 to 13 acres, 15 acres at the most, a little ridge just south of what we call the Temple Mount where the Dome of the Rock sits today. So in David's day, maybe two to 3,000 people could have lived on that hillside. Uh, Solomon, maybe four to 5,000 later kings up through Hezekiah's day, uh, maybe expanding a few thousand. But we're talking about a very small city. Mm -hmm. back, back in those days, even in Jesus' day, when it became the largest city in the whole country, walled city, and one of the largest in the whole Near East, it's still necessarily compact. If you're going to build a wall all the way around the city, it's, it can't be too big. But in David's time, that, that hilltop that would eventually become the Temple Mount was, was open, right? We learned at the end of Second Samuel that that was a threshing floor. They had used it as a threshing floor, although David, as we'll see coming up, is going to secure that spot because he already knows something about how sacred that spot has been in the past mm -hmm. and will be yet in the future. So it becomes part of the holy place. Very good. Going on now to chapter 8, uh, we have uh, David uh, subduing various enemies and I don't know that we need to spend a lot of time with these uh, scenes of warfare. In chapter 9, David uh, sets about to fulfill a, a promise which he made to Jonathan, Saul's son. Uh, as was covered in earlier sessions, David and Jonathan had been uh, uh, very good friends and had made uh, certain promises and covenants with each other. And uh, now that Saul is dead, uh, 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 his uh, son Mephibosheth is the sole uh, survivor, at least as the Bible is concerned, uh, of uh, Saul's children. And David uh, wants to make it right with that. And so in verse 5, uh, Eric, would you like to read there in verse 5? Okay. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Now when Meph Mephibosheth, is how you want to say it, right? Um, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David. He fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. Yes. And then David honors him and uh, brings him into Jerusalem and sets a place for him at the king's table, which was a great honor back in those days. And uh, uh, this shows uh, some of uh, David's uh, magnanimity, that is, his graciousness, because uh, Mephibosheth could have been a real threat to the throne, but David is going to bring him in and befriend him and, and treat him as, as one of his loyal subjects. Well, and we know, for instance, from the opening of the Book of Mormon, the importance of not just concentrating us in God, but personal agreements and covenants. We saw that with Nephi and Zoram, of course. We're all familiar with that. And so this binding promise between David and Jonathan still obtains. Yes, and it shows us what kind of a man David can be when, when he's uh, being righteous. Very good. Uh, chapter 10 uh, discusses uh, the Israelite defeat of the Ammonites, and we don't want to take too much time on that. You, you on prepared that. us with a good segue, say, when he's being righteous. Now that we're <laughs> in chapter 11, haven't you, Paul? Yeah. And now we're leading into chapter 11, which begins with uh, the, the sad story of David's fall. Uh, who is Bathsheba? Someone want to come in on that? She's the wife of Uriah the Hittite, we're told. Uriah was one of David's men at war, perhaps a mercenary. He seems to have been a non-Israelite. Um, he was. Oh, with that name, Uriah. Sort of sounds, yeah, it sounds which like means, uh, the Lord is Maybe my light. Maybe he'd been a proselyte or <laughs> accepted it the Lord. May have been you know. a convert. Sure. Yeah. Yes. But Uriah had been fighting against the Ammonites. There was a prolonged siege of Rabbah Ammon, wasn't there at this time, as they were trying to subdue the, the Ammonites. Rabbah Ammon, which today is called Ammon. Ammon, 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 the capital of Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. And so Uriah is gone, and Bathsheba is in Jerusalem, and uh, David takes one look, and I guess makes the mistake of taking a second, second look. look. He yeah. sees her out, attending to her personal hygiene on the rooftop, yeah, Kelly. It might be good to read those few verses and just see where David sinned. Go okay. ahead, Kelly. And it came to you pass, this tell is, us where you started, this is 2 Samuel 11, right from the beginning. And okay. it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, which is usually the summer months, they don't like to usually fight and get bogged down in mud in the winter, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. They destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. Uh, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. Ah, he stayed back home, not with the troops. Hmm. At the time when kings went out to, to fight, he stays back. It came to pass in evening t eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself 
And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Uh, so in these lines, we're, we're taking a, <laughs> a look at, at what point David sinned. Is there anything wrong with taking a stroll, looking out over his city? No, he happens to notice somebody bathing. No, but I heard one of the general authorities say one time, any righteous priesthood holder seeing a woman in an immodest situation will immediately turn his face right, right. and yes. not look. So my, my, my mission president used to say it's the second look that comes from the devil. <laughs> 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 you look once, you're not a man. If you look twice, you're not a missionary. You know, you <laughs> must suppress exactly. those feelings when so they come. So the woman was beautiful. David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So um, President Kimball one time said that the, the time to protect against the calamity is when the thought begins to shape itself right. and uh, destroy the seed and the plant will never grow. Yes. So he let it grow. It's kind of an interesting parallel today. You know, so many times when people find themselves in sexually compromising positions, it starts out so gradually, but you know, people, for instance, internet chat rooms, you know, I think of David sending after, inquiring after her, finding out through other people about that person. I mean, you take some effort to get into that chat room or to send that message or to, to find someone and try to find out the phone number or the address when you're a married man and when you shouldn't be even exploring those T Temptations may come, thoughts may arise, but uh, not to uh, harbor them, not to continue thinking about them and begin fantasizing about that. that's the, the danger. Yeah, we, we cannot always <coughs> control the thoughts that come into the stage of our mind, but we do control how long they stay there. Right. And, and, and that's the point with David. He was entertaining those thoughts <coughs> long, long after they had first to come on the stage of his mind. I want to say something about the Bathsheba here. Her name uh, could be translated two different ways, as all names in the Bible have meanings. Uh, it, it could mean daughter of, of the seven, but it also can mean daughter of the covenant. covenant. Yeah. And I think this is symbolic here. I think the writers of the gospel or are, are, are of, of uh, Samuel here are telling us something about uh, Bathsheba. She's not just any woman. She represents in some ways many women. Right. She's an every woman figure, a type. That's, she's yes. in a covenant relationship with her husband. She's in a covenant relationship with the Lord. It's interesting. We said we don't know about their ethnic background. They become a son of Abraham or daughter of Abraham if they had joined. It, something interesting is going on there. But of course the sin was not just that he pursued her and eventually did lie with her uh, and they conceived a child out of wedlock. It's what happens next. Yeah. He tries to cover up and, and commits the even worse crime of murder. Right. Uh, which is yes. Good. where he falls from his exaltation. <laughs> and, and in some ways it would be very difficult to, to fault Bathsheba because uh, David is the king and uh, there's not a whole lot that she can do if unless she wants to um, uh, incur the displeasure of the king. And uh, we could spend some time discussing uh, her complicity in this, but I'm not sure well, we can say a whole lot. the text is absolutely silent on it, isn't it? Yes. He sent for her, she came in, you'd come if the king called you, he lay with her. You know, we have no idea what her motivations are because the authors aren't concerned with her role, they're concerned with David. And what David does is the active part of here. Yes. And therefore, David now is uh, stuck with a problem. Uh, she is pregnant, her husband is off at war, so obviously the child is not his. his. And David has to figure some way out of this. At least he has the integrity to help her a little bit with this, but he's going to go about it all the wrong way. Right. Yes, Michael, do you want to tell us what happens? Well, he, he uh, initially tries to get Uriah to come back home uh, so that, that it will look like it, it's his child. But Uriah, the, the firm, steadfast man that he is, I'm not going to come home in the middle of battle and, and leave my men. You know, he's, he's a, a, a warrior, a, a faithful. And, uh, or when he does come home, he sleeps outside the king's door, exactly. the text says. Maybe we should read that, verse, right. verses yeah. 8 and 9. Uh, Michael, do you have that there? Sure. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house, wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. He, he just didn't feel right about doing that. Um, well, he says all the men are out in the field sleeping in tents. Yeah. My men are in tents. I'm here because the king wanted me. I'll stay outside your door, but I'm not going to home, go home and enjoy all the creature comforts while I should be at war. Exactly. It seems to me that Uriah here is the good example in all yeah, of this story. Yeah, all of the story. Uh, 
He, he's faithful, he's true, and mm. he's thinking of his men yes. right. back and, there. And, and, and we're seeing here, you know, a, a slow progression of, 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 of how, uh, as uh, Shakespeare said, oh, what a tangled web we weave, weave when first we practice to deceive. He's, he's trying to, to cover up and keep covering up, and, and the, he gets deeper and deeper, and ultimately it results in him, his carrying out this uh, a cold-blooded murder of uh, Uriah. Well, it doesn't work the first night, so in verse 12, David says to him again, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, that is, before David, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he went not down to his house. So even kind of prepping him with a little wine. Even David's preparations did mood. not work. And, and at this point, you have to wonder how far David is willing to go to make this cover-up. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, Uriah departs uh, the next day. And then what happens? So the order. Put him right up there in Put front. Him in front and, just and withdraw and <laughs> let him get Let the Ammonites do the dirty work and kill him. Yes. But the responsible one. It, yes. The one who certainly. arranged it. <clears throat> David certainly is uh, responsible for the death of Uriah the Hittite. And, and that, uh, great understatement there at the end of the, the chapter, verse 27. The thing that David done had displeased the Lord. Right. I mean, here we have two very serious sins. We have adultery and we have murder. And although we're told David wept and tried to repent, I mean, you've got that wonderful psalm, Psalm 1610, we find out that he receives, after repentance, a measure of forgiveness, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, but that suggests his soul does go to hell for a while, that there is some suffering for that. Yes. We, we learn in section 132, what, in verse 39, that David has lost his exaltation, that he had been given... Uh, Nathan, the prophet, had comes given... Comes and tells him had, that. Had, uh, yes, the Lord had allowed him to have all of these wives, many, but he wants another one. They had been given by a prophet, <laughs> yeah. they had been sealed to him, presumably through priesthood authority, and here he's on his own, he's taking something that doesn't belong to him. And of course, that moves into that touching little parable that Nathan teaches. Yes. Uh, Let's move on David into chapter 12, 12 now, where, where Nathan is going to confront David with his acts. Right. And he doesn't just come out and say, you have sinned, you've murdered, you committed adultery. He comes in and tells him a story. He, yes. he does just like Isaiah does in chapter 5, and then the Savior himself in Matthew 21, Constantly, he's, he's right. telling a little story, and then... It ends <laughs> up being against the person the he's Pharisees, telling The Pharisees, the hypocrites, uh, accuse themselves by their own mouth. Yeah, he tells the story about a rich man who has all these flocks and all these herds, and he has a neighbor who's poor and has only one little baby ewe lamb. And they treat it like a pet. They keep it in the house. The family loves him. And the rich man has a stranger come to visit him, and he doesn't, even though he has plenty of animals, he doesn't want to use an animal from his own flock, so he takes this little lamb and he, he slaughters it and feeds it up. His and neighbor's lamb his instead neighbor's of his lamb. own. That's yes. right, that's right. And yeah. David is angry. He says, this is terrible. Of course, you know, the king's supposed to be the one who enforces justice. Whoever did that, we're going to make sure that he's punished for that. We ought to read that verse. Yeah, let's that's read that. That's five, five and following. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. And of course, the parable doesn't apply completely because the poor man in this case, Uriah is dead. Not only can he not restore Bathsheba, he, he's not there to get some recompense fourfold or whatever. Yes. And the results, verse 10, now therefore the sword shall never, never depart from thy house. There's gonna be some terrible family and national problem tragedies follow his own personal tragedy. And this actually, I think, helps explain what we talked about earlier in chapter 7. You know, David has this great covenant between him and the Lord. He's always going to have a dynasty. Eventually, the Savior will come through his line. But he can't build the temple. And elsewhere here, it's, he's a man of blood, and we assume it's because of the warfare he's fighting. But, you know, the Lord knows the beginning from the end and knows what's going to happen and knows that David will not be in a position of righteousness to build this temple, I would suggest. And he's a man of blood, not just because of the warfare, but because of that murder. Because of what, of what he does to Uriah, at, 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 to finish verse 10 that you started there, Kelly, because thou hast despised me mm -hmm. and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house 
And this is a segue into what's going to happen with the rest of David's life. David is going to be besought with problems from members of his own household. Right. So At least the, two sons rebel. And, yes. Well, I need to point out something right here. We, we've, we've all known the basic elements of the story for years. What happens, the tragic conclusion of... We're talking about a man who is very spiritual, mm -hmm. deeply spiritual. He had a wonderful relationship with the Lord and wrote out uh, great prophetic things uh, as we see in the Psalms. Uh, but we need to mention why this happened. And uh, I know why. I'm, I believe that David had stopped praying and reading his scriptures, studying his scriptures. Doesn't say that right here in the text, but I know perfectly well that David had stopped praying and had stopped studying the Savior's words. Else he couldn't have done those two great sins. Well, exactly. I mean, and we know it from our own experience in life, but also if you've ever worked in an ecclesiastical position, you know from counseling people who have found themselves in difficult situations. I would ask people, are you reading your scriptures? Are you attending your meetings? Are you praying every day? And without fail, some of those basic things that we do every day to keep the relationship between us and the Lord strong, they've stopped doing. It's hard to imagine David, after he saw Bathsheba taking the bath, going home and reading the scriptures. I mean, that's what you should do. We're told to sing a hymn or to, to get it, into it that. It just doesn't follow. Or you, how you can you pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sending these messengers to go get her. Help her say yes. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea of doing those two habits every day is so that we have the spirit with us. Right. If we don't do that, we're leaving ourselves wide open for, for spiritual disaster. It's a mean world out there. So anybody that's if he were praying sincerely to Heavenly Father and had that relationship, the, the flow of the Spirit, he could not have right. done those great sins. That's a warning. But what's so tragic is, is he had been so spiritual. I was reading Josephus last night about this, actually. And as Josephus summarized basically what he took from this text, he said, David was an upright and righteous man. He was a just man. You know, He never sinned except in this instance. Now, of course, there are sins in our lives, but as far as the historical record went, people didn't know of any great transgressions of this his. This doesn't happen to Lord, overnight. This right? is a gradual thing sure, for, yeah. for sure. He had been losing the spirit. Yes. Somewhere along the line. And, and I think we need to mention that uh, uh, David felt that and sure. felt the tragedy of this and felt terrible sorrow and pain for what he had been doing. So that in, in verse 12, where the Lord says, you did it secretly, but I'm going to do this thing before all Israel and before the Son, then David, in his remorse, uh, repents. He right. it repents as much as a person That's can okay. in that situation. And we know uh, that adultery is something that can be repented yes. for. And we know that in some situations, you know, extreme situations, not one like this. There are some situations where murder is understandable, understandable, but people will lose their exaltation as David did. But he's lost everything, section 132 tells us, that he could have had those higher blessings. Yes. Uh, I, I think an important point here in verse 13 as well is uh, the Joseph Smith translation where uh, in, in the, the, the text as it reads now, uh, Nathan uh, tells David, the Lord hath also hath put away thy sin, whereas the jo Joseph Smith translation mm -hmm. adds not. He hath not put, put away, away thy sin. sin. David says, I, I've sinned, I'm really sorry, but and, and Nathan says, him. it's not, you're not forgiven, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and another interesting angle of this is, what, what if that union had meant to, was meant to be? What, what if Uriah had died had, anyway. uh, was going to be killed that week and David could, t because he has a son eventually from that woman who is the ancestor of the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe yeah. the Solomon union was the... meant to be, but he was rash indeed in disobeying. Of course, the immediate repercussions, the child that they do conceive improperly uh, dies. dies. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we need to mention that there beginning in verse 15. Uh, she, uh, she is pregnant and she delivers a child. And the name of the child is a play on words uh, because it means both a, a, a person, a man, but it also means sickly. Hmm. And so the Bible is, uh, does that quite often. It will take a perfectly good name and turn it into something that has a double meaning. Hmm. And in this case, that's what happens because the child that is born of this union, this, this uh, extramarital affair, is, is a sickly child and eventually dies. And as long as, uh, I think it's important to point out that as long as the child is alive, David is, is pleading with the Lord to save the child's life. I think David feels the remorse and wants to, uh, to make the best of this uh, terrible situation. But as soon as the child dies, 
um, in beginning of verse 20, then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he came to his own house and when he required that they set, uh, they set bread before him and he did eat. And the servants are upset at this point because normally when a child dies, you, you mourning, go into mourning. Right. And David doesn't go into mourning at this point. In fact, he comes out of his mourning because uh, it, uh, he says it doesn't do any good now that the child is dead. In verse 22, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Uh, David realizes that uh, he will eventually see his son again, mm -hmm. but the son is not coming back in this life. Yes. I won't be with him. Well, we've come to the end of our discussion of uh, Second Samuel uh, and uh, of this section of Second Samuel, and we've seen what happens when people uh, lose the spirit of the Lord and uh, forget their place in life. And consider and themselves above some commandment. If we ever think we're above right. some commandment, an exception to a rule, we get in trouble. trouble yeah. David's a perfect example. And David, as the king of Israel, was supposed to be the example par excellence of virtue and wisdom and knowledge and faithfulness to the Lord. And David, in a moment of weakness and, and loss of spirit, commits a terrible sin. It's a lesson for all of us. Thank you for participating. For more information on this program, visit our website at byubroadcasting.org.